All righty. Well, that was my cue. We have 10 o'clock on the dot. So we'll go ahead and get started. I know we have a lot of information we want to present out today. Um, so thank you all for joining us. As you heard from Zoom, we will be recording this event today. Uh, in case anyone missed it, we know life happens and we can't always attend the webinars that we wanna see, but we'll have it posted for those um, after this session in about a week or so. Um, today is March 2nd and we are presenting on a pharmacy-based approach for caring for individuals with opioid use disorder. My name is Stephanie Baker. I'm with Health-Centric Health Advisors, part of the IPRO Quinn QIO. Um, and I'm just going to go through our logistics today and then turn it over to my colleague, Margie. Um, we will be utilizing chat. Uh, and so we have Tos and David who will be monitoring that today. So please feel free to chat in any questions that you have throughout the presentation or any input that you would like to provide. We want to make sure it's an interactive session. Uh, we will be offering a uh, CEUs for pharmacy. Um, so at the end of the program, we'll have a link and a code word um, that you need to be able to receive your credit for this event. Um, so we'll make sure to put that in chat towards the end of the discussion. There are no disclosures today. And just a little background, um, we are the IPRO Quinn QIO, uh, which is a federally funded Medicare Quality Innovation Network quality improvement organization uh, with a contract with Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. There are 12 regional Quinn QIOs nationally, and IPRO Quinn QIO uh, represents New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. We have health centric advisors in the New England states, and Calera in Maryland, Delaware, and the District of Columbia. We work to ensure high quality, safe healthcare for 20% of the nation's Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. So like we said, we'd like to utilize chat today. So we wanna know who is on the webinar with us today. Feel free to uh, tell us your organization, where you're located and your role within your organization as well. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Margie, who is a medication safety pharmacist with Healthcentric Advisors to kick us off. Thanks, Margie. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. I want to start this presentation by providing a high level overview of what's happening with overdose deaths in our country, what we're doing to reduce deaths, and then a quick review on medications that we use to treat opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. So I'm sure most of us are aware that overdose deaths in the US rose sharply between 2020 and 2022. According to the CDC, predicted deaths rose from 73,000 in 2020 to more than 110,000 in 2022. <clears throat> now there was an increase of about 5.5% in this provisional data from June of 2021 through June of 2022. Now we're seeing some encouraging signs nationally that there's a slight decline in the provisional data at the end of 2022. So again, it's provisional data, not all of the numbers are in. However, it really doesn't indicate what's happening at the state levels. For example, in New England, um, especially in the northern three states, there's been an increase in overdose deaths reported in all of our states except for one. Connecticut was the only state in New England that actually saw a decline of about 5%. And some of the other states that we're working with, I can say that both Maryland and Ohio are also seeing declines. So while generally speaking, at the end of 2022, we see some promising trends. It really depends on where you live. Next slide, please. This slide is a screenshot of the IPRO Quinn QIO Opioid Utilization Dashboard. This dashboard is publicly available and it's an interactive tool that shows geographic comparisons at the state and county levels um, of de-identified information uh, from Medicare Part D opioid prescriptions filled for Medicare fee-for-service um, recipients. So again, it it's, uh, definitely has its limitations, but if you look at the data in the lower uh, right of your screen above, for the state of New York, 
for the time period um, for all opioid prescriptions from January of 2022 through June of 2022, um, when compared to the previous six months, we see a decline in the utilization rate across all New York counties. Now the dashboard also allows us to change the morphine milligram, milligram equivalent data. So if you do change that and look, at, look again at the county changes, there might be some increases. So it highlights counties where the opioid utilization may have increased. But generally speaking, this is a decline that uh, we've seen across all the states. And it kind of confirms that most of the overdose deaths that we're seeing today are more from um, illicit drug use than from actual prescribing. Um, obviously, it you know, confirms that fentanyl, um, the impact that fentanyl has had on our uh, opioid crisis as well. So I encourage everyone to really take time and explore the dashboard when you have time. Next slide, please. So this slide identifies some of the strategies that are being used to help reduce overdose deaths. Um, you know, obviously fentanyl test strips can be very helpful uh, to use to test to see if a drug somebody plans on ingesting um, has fentanyl added to it. You know, this is so commonly occurring, occurring and it's been responsible for an increasing number of overdose deaths that we're seeing. The test strips are pretty much available in most states and they're either free or have a nominal cost um, associated with them. So you should check your state where you live to determine where they can be accessed. Safe injection sites are also becoming more numerous and are appearing in more states. Uh, these injection sites give people a safe, stigma-free, no judgment environment in or, uh, to use to inject drugs. Uh, because of the problem with fentanyl being added to so many drugs, the sites are monitored so as to address any overdose if it occurs. Um, so most sites, you know, there's somebody there who can administer naloxone in case of an overdose. And they also provide um, free needle kits for people to use. So um, they're not sharing needles or using dirty needles. Uh, these sites have also played a great role in encouraging people to seek treatment. Um, naloxone, of course, is the drug that will reverse an, over, an overdose death, an opioid overdose death, um, overdose, I should say. One of the strategies to reduce deaths from overdose is to make the naloxone more available. Uh, the FDA recently moved forward to approve naloxone for over-the-counter status. It's probably going to be a few months, uh, maybe sometime in late summer before we actually see this readily available, as I'm sure they're going to have to do some labeling and packaging changes, um, et cetera. But recently, the University of Vermont Center on Rural Addiction has been authorized to distribute five intranasal naloxone vending machines to qualifying health organizations in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and Northern New York. So the vending machines are gonna be placed in centralized locations in the rural communities uh, so that we'll see improved access to naloxone in these, these communities. So I think um, we're gonna probably see more of these types of things appearing in our um, states as naloxone moves to OTC. I think one of the things that we have to be uh, cautious about and watch to see what happens is what's going to happen to the cost of naloxone as it moves into an over-the-counter status. Hopefully the cost isn't going to be um, prohibitive and again start to affect access. So just more to come with that. Next slide please. For the treatment of opioid use disorder, there's a few medications available and really at a high level. We'll do a quick review. Um, the medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder act differently on the opioid receptors in the brain. So methadone is a full opioid agonist. It replaces the need for other opioids. And when dosed properly, it blocks withdrawal symptoms and cravings. Buprenorphine is what's called a partial opioid agonist. And uh, this, this medication only partially activates the opioid receptors, but it too will ease withdrawal symptoms and cravings. And finally, we have um, an opioid receptor antagonist, which is uh, naltrexone. 
And this actually blocks the activation of opioid receptors um, in the brain and prevents the euphoric feeling of opioids and actually works on alcohol um, addiction as well. So it helps to reduce the cravings. Determining which medication is selected is really based on the needs and lifestyle of the person that um, is seeking treatment. And this is where access can become a real issue. You know, can, can the person get to a clinic to receive methadone um, every day for treatment? Is the medication affordable? Uh, can they get to counseling, et cetera? So there are many challenges to access treatment with these medications. And uh, this is what's really exciting about what uh, Dr. Bratberg is going to share with us today is his research and um, how this, his program can bring access to buprenorphine into the community. So next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Bratberg, Bratberg is a professor of pharmacy practice at the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy. His research is focused on the essential and emerging roles community pharmacists play regarding opioid overdose, harm reduction, and opioid use disorders. Uh, Jeff is an associate editor of the Journal of the American Pharmacists Association and is on the board of directors of the Association for Multidisciplinary Education and research in substance use and addiction. And at this time, I would like you to join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jeff Rappert. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for joining. I'm uh, of course even more intimidated by seeing this list of uh, wonderful people on here. So I'm hopeful to kind of get through the slides and answer your questions and, and uh, thank you for to Tosin for, for managing things. Um, definitely go Rams uh, future uh women's basketball team ncaa champs you've heard it here first all right so i know nothing about basketball but i know a lot about um overdose uh, one thing that i always like to acknowledge is uh uri was you can uh, read this at your at your leisure because i want to get to things but just to acknowledge uh where we are and uh what we're doing in terms of dei or dejai next slide please next slide Everybody knows who I am. So again, uh, we have some learning objectives because we're doing CE. So we're gonna recognize the need for barrier-free models of buprenorphine access, uh, look at our collaborative practice uh, agreement for pharmacy-based buprenduction that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and then talk a little bit about the characteristics of the participants in the model to try to merge, uh, go back to that first objective to why we need um, low barrier or no barrier access to buprenorphine um, everywhere. Next slide, please. So we're just going to review these questions again to have in your mind to think about what the we'll repeat these at the end, which the following has been documented as a barrier. Is it manufacturer drug shortages, lack of third party prior authorizations, drug drug interactions or patient skin color? Next slide, please. And then the key elements was it uh, that allowed initiation of bup in the pharmacy? Was it state pharmacist DEA registration in Rhode Island permitting uh, payment for services for uh, via pharmacist provider status? Was it patient-initiated saliva toxicology testing, or was it the public health emergency audio-only induction rules? Next slide. And then which groups were disproportionately represented in our population that we studied as compared to our 2020 census? Was it uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Were it Hispanic people, white people, or Asian folks? Next slide. So we got a lot of press on this. Uh, I think I've been trying to manage all of the press, which is which is great. It seems like this is a, a hot topic and something I want to do. And I appreciate talking about this sort of for the first time. Uh, so you can find a lot about this uh, in via the media groups at both at, at Brown University Lifespan and, and URI. Um, but really, this goes to the pharmacist. I wasn't the pharmacist in the in the in our community pharmacies, Genoa Pharmacy, doing this. And so my uh, colleague and of course you or I grad, uh, Dr. Tara Nova said in this paper from Pew just a week ago, my experience with patients showing me that many people seeking treatment, pay attention here, face homelessness, stigma, judgment, and economic barriers every day. Uh, Genoa Pharmacy, if you don't know, is the fourth or fifth largest pharmacy chain in the country that focuses on care of patients with behavioral health problems. So coming into a pharmacy and being greeted by a pharmacist who wants to sit down with you and talk about being healthy was very much appreciated. Really love that quote. Um, they found it rewarding. The next thing I highlighted there is the improvement we saw, right? This is what's so great about treating addiction. And one of the things we need to spread the word about our interactions with patients to feel gratefulness for getting gratefulness 
for getting help in a way and manner that they weren't used to, which is we have to look at our system and see the problems and acknowledge them and fix them. This is one of the fixes, but there's more to be done was rewarding. And then, you know, I'd be more than willing to jump in and keep helping addiction patients that the program were to ramp up. Hello, world. Uh, we'd all be willing to participate again and continue where we started. Next slide. So that's a pharmacist perspective. And here's my colleague, Dr. Rich, well known in addiction circles nationally, internationally. Um, so this is another reason for pharmacists. While we what we have in this epidemic is a workforce issue, we don't have enough bodies prescribing buprenorphine. And I just met with him last week and he said the same thing. Physicians have had more than 20 years to go ahead and prescribe it for their patients. And as you know, the, uh, the omnibus bill at the end of December uh, removed the X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. So we're sort of waiting for data to see if physicians will pick up um, their computers and prescribe buprenorphine if they have DEA licenses. But again, we've had 20 years to prescribe it and the vast majority have said, no, thank you. But pharmacists are the most highly trained and underappreciated health professionals we have. And they're in the trenches. They see what's going on. We need them now. And apparently, as you heard from Andrew in our study, they're up for the task. So that's my raw, raw moment here. So now we have to find out what the problems are. Let's go to the next slide, please. So one thing I always show in my slides, and I just talk, talked to uh, admitted pharmacy students, some high school seniors yesterday at URI, and showed the same slide. And I really like how we've changed our oath. Maybe it's changed. To, I anticipate everyone is probably a recent grad, or at least looks like it uh, from the screens here. So I will apply my knowledge and experience to advance health equity. So I really want to emphasize that. Be self-aware. And then the third statement here, I will champion diversity and inclusion, respect the perspectives of others, which I want to emphasize. I do respect what people think and want to hear what you think if it's different than what I'm saying. And again, mitigate my personal biases, which are some of the struggles we have both with prescribers and pharmacists who are involved in addiction care and particularly buprenorphine. And we'll highlight some of those barriers. Next slide, please. So really important. I think that Another slide I usually use uh, and from our folks uh, in Ontario here, really great thing that I modified here is that it's a spectrum of use. We, while we do have over 108,000 people dying of uh, opioid related overdoses a year, the highest ever, Rhode Island has the greatest, some of the greatest mitigation and prevention treatment efforts. And we still had the highest number of people die uh, in 2022 uh, than ever before, 436 uh, lives were lost. But it's important when we think about medications, both those to treat uh, substance use disorder and substances, is that they are using them beneficially or non-problematically, and then it translates to problematic use, harmful use, and substance use disorder, but 90% of people using substances don't meet that requirement. So to think about uh, sort of a pyramid in terms of SUD at the top. Next slide, please. And when we look at the cascade of care for those who are diagnosed, uh, we have those who are at risk, which is a very large population. And uh, several researchers recently have published lots of literature on trying to quantify that, actually some, some done in uh, Massachusetts uh, from my colleagues there. Then are you receiving a leakage intervention? Notice that's less. Again, pharmacists can play a role there. Treatment initiated, which we're gonna talk about and retained in treatment, which our preliminary data shows that we are helping them retain in treatment more than usual care coming to a journal near you, and then those who are in recovery. And really, when we think about recovery, recovery is treatment, um, involves treatment, right? So it's not just not using drugs or using treatment, it's those who may be using some drugs and on treatment or who lives have balanced out and, and don't need treatment and don't need drugs. There's a spectrum there of recovery that I think is, is, is that the public is not aware of. Next slide, please. So when we think of that cascade of care, at each of those steps, we have barriers. And so stigma really surrounds all of this multifaceted stigma, societal stigma, government stigma, or policy stigma. We see it in us and healthcare providers. We see it in our institutions. Talk to anyone who uses drugs who went to an emergency department. In our states, I guarantee you that they have received stigmatizing and discriminatory care. Um, that may be enhanced by our um, inadequate regulatory environment, uh, which is, slowly taking tiptoe steps to being more improved. We have financial barriers. Again, we heard that in Andrew's quote. And then patient engagement. If a patient knows that they're gonna be delivered stigmatizing or discriminatory care, they're not gonna receive care at all. But we tried to, uh, our data show that we reached out to those folks. Next slide, please. 
and the one thing I, I always like putting this slide in from our uh, from Kelly et al. and uh, from about 12 years ago is that even the language we use, and, and we could have a whole talk on this, uh, they did this study where they asked, how do you feel about two people actively using drugs and alcohol? And they, they thought if somebody was a substance abuser, they would benefit from punishment, realize the war on drugs has failed, nobody benefits from punishment. Um, they are more socially threatening the person to, is to blame themselves for substance related difficulties instead of our frayed and inadequate social support network in this country. Um, and um, we're, we're not able to control substance use without help. But if you call it a substance use disorder, those kinds of thoughts of that person as described is there. So if you're using stigmatizing language, if we're using it in our writing, in our speech, um, folks are less likely to receive treatment, more likely to be isolated. And we know from the ongoing pandemic of respiratory coronavirus that we uh, were more like isolation is, is uh, increases mortality. And again, that, that's one of those higher risk of adverse outcomes, both continuing use. Um, and as you heard from Margie, the um, fentanyl contaminates many, many white powders uh, across the country now. Next slide, please. And then there's barriers beyond stigma, which is sort of talked about criminalization are still focused on absence-based models. Prohibitive policies, one example, um, some people are removed from uh, both medication, pharmacotherapy treatment, uh, if they're using cigarettes or if they're using cannabis, especially in the state that has uh, legalized or decriminalized cannabis. There's, we talked about financial barriers and really lack of training in providers, which again, with our new changes in the law, really interested to see what's going to happen there and really paucity of research or allocation of resources, which we can now overcome through both federal outlays and, uh, and, and at least for a decade in some places, uh, the opioid settlement funds and how they should be used. Next slide, please. So again, we've talked about um, additional inequities in care, again, barriers, and again, really wanna emphasize the inequities of care. Uh, people who are in Medicaid, systemic racism, again, with COVID-19, we saw decreased access to opioids. It just was a prohibitive um, a prohibition type of, of natural experiment, so to speak, that showed that uh, when people have decreased access to opioids, they use more dangerously, use alone more often, uh, that this the supply is even more unsafe. There's more co-use of substances. Alcohol use is up 300%. Um, if you don't have access, you lose tolerance to opioids, putting you at higher risk of overdose, both fatal and non-fatal. And there was actually less non-prescribed buprenorphine access, which two states in our uh, region here, Vermont and Rhode Island, have decriminalized buprenorphine possession, but we need to go farther. Again, when we look at medication for OUD, only one in nine are actually getting treatment. These are people who are, we think are diagnosed. Uh, we can't dispense methadone for OUD in the U.S., although there's a trial at Yale going on uh, that will give us the same data we know from Australia and Canada and the U.K. and Switzerland and Norway and everywhere else that pharmacy uh, is a place for methadone, but we'll focus on that later. And then again, pharmacists weren't permitted to prescribe buprenorphine via waiver, um, but as autonomous prescribers, they can get state DEA authority. Uh, and we know of pharmacists who are actually prescribing buprenorphine in the VA system if they have a DEA um, from one of those states. So that's an exciting thing, but we're gonna talk about collaborative practice agreements. Next slide. Really wanna emphasize on black folks because they were uh, a key uh, disproportionately represented at those who were receiving treatment from pharmacies. Um, one, of the, one of the goals in, in researching for my papers is that they really face barriers in every step of that cascade. So we know when looking at clinician visits, Black people are less likely to receive prescriptions for buprenorphine compared to white people who go to emergency departments with an opioid-related uh, finding. Uh, they're less likely to both be administered bup on the spot and or given a prescription. We know that looking at pregnant folks, uh, they're less likely to receive almost over a third less likely to receive medications, Black pregnant people than white people. When we look at Medicaid-covered patients with OUD, even more striking, 42% less likely to receive um, OUD. And in terms of COVID-19 effects on access to care, which I alluded to earlier, uh, we saw no decrease in prescribing, relative prescribing for white folks than for black folks. So that's uh, just another call to, to, to do this work. Continue, please. Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, the other thing is retention and care. And so we have very poor retention and care to begin with. We have very poor initiation and care. Really, you know, we, we saw you know 13% of people get treatment overall, and then we see these disparities 
uh, based on people's skin color. Uh, and so Stringfellow and Dong and colleagues just recently published looking at the median episode and you can see um, racial and ethnic minority groups even over all of these years from 2006 to 2020. Um, when we stratify, we just see that, you know, at in the second graph there, episodes of at least 180 days, we just see a dramatic disparity. So I thought that that was uh, something to share. Next slide, please. So I'm actually part of uh, Immersa, which you heard about. Everyone should join. Uh, abstracts are due in May and our conferences in DC in November. And we're working to advocate for increased MOUD access. So everyone should join. I got to do that as a board member. Uh, but we published this after the George Floyd murder uh, in 2020, dismantling racism against BIPOC folks. Uh, and, and one of the key statements I think is worth reading is that we insist that all persons who use drugs be treated with compassion and life-saving services, really emphasized in that quote from, uh, from uh, Andrew Terranova, one of the pharmacists in our study, driven by anti-racist and anti-oppressive principles, whether they're seeking effective drug treatment options, again, buprenorphine, one of the most effective drugs that we have, or tools and resources that Margie talked about to reduce the harms of ongoing drug use. We cannot afford to continue to ignore the structural racism that underlies this treatment. I think I've emphasized this to you uh, and harm reduction services for people who use drugs. Next slide, please. In fact, and, and I think this may reflect not just Rhode Island, but um, pre-pandemic this was presented uh, behavioral health issues here were, you know, uh, among hundreds of people who were surveyed in the public in Rhode Island, 90% agree addiction is chronic and lifelong. It's probably higher than a lot of places. Uh, nearly 90% agree that people who suffer from substance use should have access to treatments, but only 60% believe that medication is appropriate. So again, that giant stigma oval still, it still exists even in places with, I think, a lot of uh, great interventions we're doing in Rhode Island. Next slide, please. So again, bupe works. I'm probably preaching to the choir here, reduces mortality by 50%. Tell me, I always say, tell me another medication that reduces mortality by 50%. And in some studies, 79% that done in France, you know, two decades ago now, uh, reduces opioid use, reduces HIV and hep C. Um, when we increase access, we see reduced overdose deaths. That was in Baltimore with Schwartz and colleagues. Increases social functioning, increases quality of life, increases maternal and fetal outcomes. We talked about that. Um, and it's uh, some, one of my colleagues from Brown uh, rarely found in overdose death toxicology. And there's a new study that shows that bupe is rarely found in toxicology. So this is not killing people, even though it is an opioid, it is truly life-saving uh, in, in many, many ways. Next slide, please. And in fact, um, the, the first physician head of the uh, White House Office on National Drug Control Policy or ONDCP, Dr. Gupta, uh, published this uh, last year in the New England Journal, uh, along with some other colleagues that some of you may know, transforming management of OUD with universal treatment, right? So we need education. We see that both of the public and providers. We need to increase access. We need to preserve telemedicine access. That's a whole other conversation. Access for incarcerated patients. Rhode Island pioneered that in 2016. Everyone gets continued treatment or initiated treatment or screen in both our jail and prison in Rhode Island to great success reducing mortality by 60% from those who receive treatment than those who don't. And then we need, and again, not only systemic racism, but all the other social determinants of health to increase that retention and, and recovery. Next slide. Um, and then if you actually get a prescriber and you actually get MOUD, you may not actually get it at your pharmacy, right? So we, we know that there's studies showing that pharmacies are not stocking. Um, we looked at a study of a thousand pharmacies. My colleagues uh, Adrian Irwin and Kezaruni and others uh, from Oregon looked that you know one in five are unable to unable to dispense buprenorphine when called. Uh, maybe higher if you go in person. This is higher in independent pharmacies versus chain pharmacies. Higher in the southern region versus others. And even if available, if it was available, they did have quantities uh, to dispense for new and existing patients. And then there's these perceptions on. Wholesaler limitations uh, probably derived from uh, settlement lawsuits. Um, there's a cost to stocking buprenorphine. If there's no customer demand, there's no demand because there's no customers, because there's no prescribers, right? So we need to unify these things, have pharmacists prescribe and stock addiction medicines like uh, buprenorphine. And then, of course, prescribing stigma. Next slide, please. Our colleagues in, in Philadelphia published this great paper on red flags and red tape. And again, this is more about telehealth barriers where pharmacists were perceived in qualitative research, they treated opiates all the same. Um, 
distinguishing patients. Here's the stigmatizing thing. Are you a troublemaker or is this a legitimate prescription? Um, following DEA, what's called corresponding responsibility. Um, there's geographic hurdles. Uh, there may be company policies you can't prescribe or dispense buprenorphine to someone who's uh, outside of your region or from a physician or prescriber who's outside your region. There was a desire to focus on business outcomes versus community health outcomes. So it's a broader educational point for public health. Um, and then just suspicion, control, abandonment, and punishment, you know, avoidance, legal gatekeeping, medical gatekeeping from the community that's not, again, reducing deaths by half. Uh, so we've got a ways to go here. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, uh, Watanabe and, and Dima Cutto had this really fascinating uh, paper in JAMA Health Forum, which had sort of goals, actions, and responsibilities. And again, I think all of us are represented there from the responsible agencies to protect distributors and pharmacies from DEA, DEA liability and litigation. Just say, this is an exception. Uh, I would agree with that. Ensure availability. Massachusetts and other states have mandated naloxone stocking. We need to mandate buprenorphine stocking and just say it has to be there so it's accessible to folks. Um, and then we need to pass legislation to fill all valid buprenorphine, right? All legitimate. We, you, the fact that we need a law to say you need to do the right thing is a little disappointing, but I think that's where we're at. Um, we know that in Rhode Island, we mandated uh, a help pass legislation to co-prescribe, mandate co-prescribing naloxone. And we have the greatest, as a result of that and other interventions, the greatest uh, pharmacy-based naloxone prescribing per capita in the world, essentially, in, in Rhode Island, um, along with a very robust community naloxone dispensing. So we need to do this for BUP, and, and there's efforts we can do in our states and federal agencies. Next slide, please. Um, I am an active member of the American Pharmacists Association, and again, so that their policies supported by their hundreds of delegates have said, you know, uh, you know evidence-based medicine is first-line treatment. Um, also for professionals, right? We often deny licensure and employment for people who are using buprenorphine or methadone uh, to treat their chronic relapsing remitting substance use disorder. Uh, we encourage pharmacies to maintain an inventory. So there it is. I helped write that one. Um, and ensure patients have equitable access to at least one medication from each class, right? Used in the treatment of OUD. And just last year, um, APHA advocated for pharmacists' independent prescription authority, not what we did in the CPA of MOUD um, to expand patient access to treatment. So we're seeing this on the, on the national pharmacy level as well. Next slide, please. There's a lot here. You can read these. My colleague uh, and friend, Alyssa Peckham, um, was phenomenal in putting together this for some other talks we did on buprenorphine. So it really also talks about pharmacies in other roles. I'm going to talk about that community role. I just wanted to, you know, in the middle there was like, let's get rid of the data waiver or have pharmacists added to it. So that happens. So progress, uh, hope springs eternal, as they say. So I think there's a lot of things to be done. Next slide, please. So we uh, coined uh, my colleague uh, and lead author on the paper, Tracy Green, collaborator in many, many things, called this Pharmacy Bridge. If you've been to Rhode Island, we have lots of bridges. Um, so taking you as far as you want to go today was our, was our sort of phrase here. And we'll talk about sort of what that means. But basically, low barrier care from a paper written five years ago now um, is that we provide care that's evidence-based, BUP saves lives, emphasizes harm reduction, it doesn't result in overdose. We can co-prescribe naloxone. Has a low barrier to entry. When people want it, they need to get it. And it's longitudinal. It's sustained without financial or geographic or other barriers. Telehealth works. And so when we shift our focus to providing individualized care, incorporates patient-centered outcomes, meeting them where they're at, we can help them, people with OUD, achieve remission, however they define it, and lead improved lives. Next slide. So one of the reasons that we uh, were successful uh, is we had a larger study in 2018. We had a pilot trial that showed success. And, uh, and then we went to a randomized control trial comparing pharmacy-based maintenance of BUP with, far with uh, usual care. And we had, um, as we were recruiting, the COVID pandemic happened, which was uh, an interesting time to do research and do other things, but we got through it. But some of the... Uh, some of the, the, the relief that federal agencies gave on buprenorphine prescribing allowed us to adapt to providing audio only physician delegated buprenorphine induction from pharmacies. So we had already trained everybody. And so the other thing that happened actually pre-pandemic is we have the only statewide or uh, I should say 
uh, for the pharmacies involved that they could treat withdrawal without contacting anybody. The patient could be assessed, dispense 24 hours of medication, uh, and dose it based on, on, on medications. That wasn't part of the trial, except for people who had severe withdrawal. And then we also did BUP induction where the patient was assessed. Uh, pharmacists would speak to the provider, come up with a treatment plan and begin treatment. So a little different than how many of you probably are familiar with how CPAs work, but that was all because of um, DEA and SAMHSA relief um, starting three years ago now. Next slide, please. So this is our, again, there's a lot going on here and I just sort of wanted to define things because some of this may be unfamiliar terminology. Um, so any opioid history, 18 plus on treatment or interest in OUD. So the patient would either present directly to the pharmacy, to a provider, emergency department that's directly from our uh, supplement to the New England Journal of Medicine letter, history of opioid use and interest in starting treatment. But the vast majority of our patients in the induction trial that started two years ago was uh, were recruited from outreach. These weren't pharmacies that people just walked in and knew that they were providing it. We had a, we had a significant outreach. And so I, I really credit that with getting patients who are interested. And so then in the assessment, the pharmacist would do a COWS or a clinical opiate withdrawal scale. They had no withdrawal, which was the majority of folks. Um, they could get facilitated home induction, get medicine, wait till uh, withdrawal occurred, and then treat themselves. Unobserved. And again, we, we, I would, I would like to just make a point that since a significant number of our folks uh, were unhoused, home induction was perhaps a little um, stigmatizing in itself. So we like to call it unobserved uh, induction, but in the paper, I think it's home induction. They had mild to moderate withdrawal. They could get counseling and referral to induction, or they could get a bridge regimen. Uh, one of the other COVID-19 adaptations that happened in Rhode Island is published elsewhere is we actually have a 24 hour buprenorphine hotline. And that's described there where anyone can call the hotline uh, get assessed on the phone, again, through these audio only um, uh, 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 regulations uh, from the DEA and SAMHSA, and they could get, they could go to the pharmacy to get it. So we sort of flip that success on its head and to say, let's recruit people, have them come to the pharmacy, get assessed, they could get their medicine and talk to the, and the pharmacist would talk to the, the data waiver um, providers in our CPA at the pharmacy. If they were in severe withdrawal, this is where that withdrawal protocol happened. Um, where they could get a fridge regimen or pharmacist run withdrawal treatment. And when they were in less withdrawal, they could come back and do that. We didn't really have anybody fall into that category. Next slide, please. And so we assessed 171 people. We excluded 71. Again, this is all in our, in our, in our supplement. Um, one person completed the study. Two people didn't have OUD. Two people were screened twice. Two people were on methadone. Um, 51 declined to participate. So most people did enter eligibility. We consented 100 people um, and 42 people, again, the majority, 39, didn't come to their second stabilization uh, visit. Uh, one didn't stabilize uh, I uh, and, and two became ineligible because we found out that they actually were on methadone too. And then all those consented, we randomized them because that was the key to entering them into the induction phase is that they either stayed at the pharmacy or they went to usual care once inducted and stabilized. Next slide, please. So we see at the top, they're randomized. They went to allocate again in this, this consort diagram. Again, it's all, it's, if you have access to the New England Journal of Medicine, this, this is all in our supplement there. So it was allocated to standard care or treatment care. But the fascinating thing is that in the 30 day retention, and this is our key finding, 25 in the treatments, so I'm gonna go in the, the, the pharmacy arm, um, 25 stayed, only three discontinued, one transferred to standard care and two dropped out. So pretty good retention. Uh, and, and fascinating that they stayed there. Those that were sent to standard care, so remember they were inducted in the pharmacy, stabilized in the pharmacy, and once they were randomized, they were sent to there. Um, 25 were not retained in it. 19 refused allocation and wanted to stay at the pharmacy, even though they were said, you know, you can't continue your care here. One was administratively delayed, three were on methadone maintenance, and then two dropped out of medical care. And so then we analyzed both and showed the following differences. Next slide. So 58% were stabilized. This is about uh, 10 to 20% higher than in other uh, low barrier trials. Um, again, 89% stayed in pharmacy care, 17 in usual. Um, we only had six dropouts in pharmacy, 16 in usual care. Um, and again, seven refused to leave pharmacy. Five took four to eight weeks, again, without care to transfer to the usual care provider. And again, no deaths, no adverse serious adverse events. And very importantly, we 
um, co-dispensed and co-prescribed via a standing order with the pharmacy in our state uh, were dispensed uh, naloxone. Next slide. And here's really the big thing and the third outcome is to think about who are the patients that we are missing, right? We are missing so many patients, 80 to 90% of our patients we're not get, who want treatment aren't getting it. And so, and we know that there's great disparities there, uh, unfortunately, based on, on race, um, which follows other medical care as well. So our pharmacy-based care, and I think this is a really important point here, promotes racial and economic equity and access to care. 76% of these folks had no reliable access to a vehicle. I, I grew up in the Midwest. I went to school in North Dakota. I know distances between places, right? Um, I was just talking to a friend in Maine, you know, there's a lot of distance there. You don't, uh, those are places that really need pharmacy-based care, but these are folks who got care that they typically could not have entered and sustained in care. They don't have a vehicle even in the smallest state in, in the nation. 44%, almost a majority were unhoused and so needed, uh, needed help with these things. And when we look at the 2020 census data, 80% of Rhode Island is white. Of our 100 folks, 66 were white. Again, uh, the majority, um, we had a disproportionate uh, a number of folks who identified as BIPOC. And so you can see there, double the number, almost double the number of Black or African American identifying folks. They were self identified versus 20 for BIPOC. And then Hispanic percentages were the same. Next slide. And so people inducted into pharmacy, they can stabilize compared to community based care. Um, stigma disrupts engagement in care. People who start in the pharmacy should stay. We, we don't need to do this study again. We just need to do this. It's what we need to do. Uh, we're promoting racial and economic equity, but we do need more research to say, what are those supports that are needed to optimize the rates of induction versus other, uh, as compared to other novel care, uh, low barrier care models, such as through uh, drug user health or certain service programs. Uh, through um, through OTPs, through other kinds, through mobile outreach and all these other things that folks are trying and succeeding with. Next slide. And so I wrote a corollary uh, to this to say uh, on, on preserving dignity, because again, one thing that I have is in both dispensing, but also prescribing is that we need to preserve people's dignity and denying any drug that is safe and effective. I do not believe that the pharmacy or medicine's role, public health's role is to deny care, but to expand care as long as it's safe and effective in this intervention, I think proved it at least in our preliminary data. So pharmacists, prescribing clinicians, other treatment advocates, what we need to do is sustain access to high quality, and I amended it here, behavioral health care, education, regulatory change, right? Every one of us is a first responder. Every one of us is an advocate. We need to expand scope of practice. We need payment reform, or, and we need to test out payment reform um, using this, this, this ideal time of opioid settlement funds. You know, Mass is getting, Massachusetts is getting a billion dollars, and, I, and Ohio is getting multi-billion dollars, I believe. So medication first advocates, we have to go beyond stocking dispensing. We have to solve those things beyond insurance limitations, right? Folks who enter our study were insured uh, or were given if they were uninsured or underinsured, they did get a month supply and were successfully transitioned through a social worker in another part of the study. And really, again, all pharmacists should advocate for permanent change to collaborative practice. We need to modify those, uh, those laws. We're, we introduced a bill in Massachusetts to, to change it to allow it to happen there. Um, and telehealth policies to permit controlled substance initiation and maintenance through CPAs as long as everyone's getting paid in that model. Next slide, please. So now we have the learning objectives. Do we want to answer questions and then go to the go to the polls? It's up to you. I think we got maybe 15 minutes and then we can answer these questions. Sure. Um, Tosin, are there some questions in chat? Just about the slides, and I believe they will be made available after the presentation. Yep, yep, they definitely will. And if there are any questions, feel free to chat them in, or if you would like, uh, come off mute um, to ask your question. So we'll pause and give you a moment uh, to do that. I think we do we have a question in chat. Do you want to do you want to read it, Tosin, or do you want me to? Sure, sure. Just very impressive presentation. I talk and really I think, fast. 
my students say that they they listen to my colleagues at uh, at double speed, and then they're like, "But you, we don't we don't ever speed up your lectures." So I apologize. I had a lot to get through. I think yeah. Jean's got a question. Yes, yeah. feel free to come off mute, Jean. Oh, what a fantastic presentation! Thank you so much. Um, I'm a little curious about if, and I'm wondering if you could say more about. You said something in the beginning about the pharmacy chain that was the you know, you said how large it was and that they specialized in behavioral health. And I wondered if you could say more about that because we've been working on uh, the concept of having certified pharmacies that have additional um, um, services related to behavioral health and in particular MOUD. And I'm wondering if you could explain that. Right. I have uh, just I, I don't know how transparent I need to be, but I like to be more than less. Uh, I don't I don't work for Genoa. They were a, a full partner and supporter of the research. This is federally sponsored research and, and they were a partner. Uh, so it's Genoa Pharmacy and they are. Um, yeah, they're the fourth or fifth largest chain. They're growing um, and they um, they're phenomenal um, and uh, very, very active MOUD. Um, in a recent call, um, I serve on a lot of state committees. They did a survey of buprenorphine stocking at pharmacies and access, and, and they had they were the only people really besides some independent pharmacies that we have here that that never had any problems. So yeah, so you can look up Genoa Healthcare. Um, I think is their is their website. But uh, yeah, there were there was there were seven pharmacies at the time. I think there's six now. They're located in there's no there's a great one that's uh, there's one that just opened in a rural area. In Rhode Island, um, and I know there's they're all over the country. They're headquartered, I think, in in, in Washington State. But they're usually so. I, let me just take a step back to the, probably the most important thing to think about why you haven't heard of Genoa is they're embedded with community mental health agencies. So you'd go see your provider, and then the pharmacies there. There's not like an over the counter. They don't have you know um, uh, holiday music making devices seemingly all year. Uh, so that's a great thing, but they are a retail pharmacy. They are a community pharmacy. So you can walk in, any person can get their stuff filled there, but there's very, they're used to close collaborations with uh, mental health clinicians, behavioral health clinicians, uh, very familiar with the uh, behavior with substance use disorder treatment. And, uh, and, and I would say, and based in the data that we collected of the pharmacists involved, you know, they're, they're sort of baseline, com more compassionate towards mental and behavioral health, because that's, that's their business, that's 90% of their business, while also providing uh, medication therapy management in terms of other primary care and chronic diseases that uh, of course are sometimes more prevalent among people with behavioral health uh, diagnoses. Oh, that is so helpful. We do have one like that in uh, West Virginia called PROACT, it's um, in Huntington. And um, they, have, they have less trouble with their distributor having enough medication on hand, which is a really, really big deal in our region, uh, down in uh, region three, which is the mid-Atlantic states. There's, so thank there's, you. A, there's a problem everywhere. It's it's really, it. that's, I can't solve that problem. I, I can just yeah. try to advocate. That's, Bupe needs to be treat, treated differently, period. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. I loved everything you said. Thanks. And then we have a question directed to Stephanie. Will we, will we be able to share the comments that were shared in today's um, chat? Um, yes, I think we can do that. Um, we'll awesome. include it with the slides. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments from the audience? Hi, yes, this is um, this is Shirley Madewell from New York State. I had a question, um, actually uh, sort of a, an inquiry of more information. Um, you had talked a little bit about uh, folks who didn't want to leave pharmacy care uh, in the study, and I may have misheard, but I just wanted to know a little bit more if you had an understanding of um, what that perspective was about um, and, and sort of what was the end result of it. We're still analyzing that group again in the in the you know there's the big study and then there's the induction folks who again who still received the, the, the bigger study was actually a three month comparison of um, a pharmacy directed care versus non usual care. The induction was just sort of the, the and, and stabilization was an add on because of we were allowed to do it uh, and receive state approval and lawyers and everything too. Um, yeah, I 
I think we have we have not fully analyzed that subset of folks to find out why they wanted to stay in the pharmacy. I can give you some anecdotes. I would say that for all the reasons I've said that pharmacy care is just more valuable, they're open. And again, this was a pharmacy that was not open longer hours and was not open, uh, none of them, I, I, early, except early in the trial were open on Saturdays, but it was an idea of, it's just, it's just a pharmacy is different than OTPs in most places. And um, um, I don't know how many people actually, that's a great question, I think on my, my paper about the baseline demographics of these folks. I don't know how many had received methadone before, but majority of them were, were treatment experienced, had received buprenorphine before, and just couldn't maintain uh, that. I mean, we toxicology tested them. We never, ever refused medicine for anybody for any reason. That, and I think that's the key. And that was the belief in both the prescribing phar uh, the pharmacists and the prescribers is that if you're having a problem, if you have positive cannabis, if you smell like you smoke cigarettes, if you, I mean, these are all things that are legitimate things that people get kicked out of care and then likely die from our unsafe supply that cannot be controlled by the federal government, no matter what they're uh, attempting to do. Um, you cannot, supply side interventions have failed to work, much like criminalization efforts. And so the idea is, gee, if you just treat people compassionately, figure out where they're at, understanding that 80 or 90% of our care system is not medications and not treatment, but it's social determinants of health. And that's why I like to focus on that so much and that, yeah, it's great. I can throw up my hands and go, well, we should house and employ everybody. Uh, right now, let's just have pharmacists prescribe buprenorphine and refer them to care and provide care for their other interventions. And so it isn't that our usual care was any worse. It's just that I'm guessing, and based on historical data of people who use drugs or people who use opioids, that, and the, the, what I spent so much time on in the beginning, the stigma and discrimination that our care systems typically deliver to them if I say, wow, you're now stabilized on bup, you're now safe from overdose, but you know, because you're in a study, which you've had consent for and an hour long interview with our, uh, and survey with our um, expert research associates and assistants that I bet they said, well, I don't wanna go to usual care. I'm just gonna keep going to the pharmacy. That was a very long answer, but I, I just think it was just an environment that was new, was friendly. We saved their life, you know, week one, and now they're being told to go to usual care which is not necessarily bad, but I think that that was the reason why they probably stayed at the pharmacy. But I don't know if we asked that exact question in our, in our um, follow-up surveys either. Well, it's very interesting stuff. Thank you. And thank you for the further description of it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. I think we have a question from Lynn. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. This is a great presentation. I really appreciate your passion about this subject. It's so needed. Um, I would just say on this very question that Shirley just asked that in my experience working in uh, substance abuse uh, use, misuse treatment, and we used to call it substance abuse treatment, but um, <clears throat> there was also an equally st strong reticence to change care. So we had to, you know, go to a different clinic. If they moved neighborhoods, they would do whatever it took to come back to the one clinic that they felt the safest and most comfortable with. And I would, this is a really interesting co dot connecting that I never made before, but it would be really interesting to just look at that pattern and the impact of trauma and why people are involved in addiction in the first place. Cause I would speculate that that's the, the root of all of that. And so, that makes a case for trauma-informed care and so on. So thank you. And, and again, you know, what's, what's easy, what I always say to people, I said, how much I asked my uh, pre, pre, hopefully you or I going pharmacy students yesterday or your future students, I said, how much time does it take to judge people? Like, do you spend more energy judging people? Is that, is that a negative feedback loop to judge people or to just not judge people and just accept them where they are, right? It's an easy thing. It's hard to do it to say. It's a hard thing to do in practice to not judge because we live in a judgment society, right? And and uh, and stigma has many levels, both institutional and personal and family. And addiction is right there, intensely uh, existing in each of those fields. I think so. Yeah, I'm a huge advocate for trauma informed care and why people are are doing this. I think um, just another note on transportation that I, I didn't put in. 
we provided transportation from wherever they were. So we worked with Uber Health. Again, I know no no stock in Uber Health, but we and there's other there's actually other forms of transportation that we can use. Um, and our Medicaid system actually a large proportion of our large part of our state budget and probably yours too goes to Medicaid and goes to transportation actually, even in the tiniest state here. And so um, folks could be like, let's say we are at uh, downtown Providence and we had our outreach workers there and they say, do you want treatment today? You can get treatment today. We're going to call Uber Health. Hang out with me. Let's ask you a few questions at screen them in. And they would come to the pharmacy and get and get and get care. Or they would be set up an appointment the next day and say, where do you want to be picked up? Where do you want to be dropped off? So we actually part of the funding for the trial were things like that. People who didn't have phones, we gave them phones. So we gave them phones. We referred them to access to food and housing and employment. Um, and again, I'll go back to that first statement that Andrew said he was there for majority of these patients and there are multiple pharmacies involved and he just said to see people grow. That's, that's the business of healthcare there is to say you had nothing, you were left by the system, you're vulnerable, you're marginalized by society, can't fix those things right now, but I can at least make sure you're alive tomorrow and, and go on um, and, and improve your life that way. Thank you. Any any further questions? Maggie, I think I saw your hands. I, didn't I, know, we're, <laughs> I know we're running short on uh, time, but Jeff, I'm wondering, at first, thank you, it was a great presentation, but how heavy a lift is this going to be to really expand this? Because, um, you know, I'm fully supportive of what pharmacists can do. And, you know, you, know, you talked about tapping into maybe some, some of the federal funding. Um, just trying to look at the reality of it. And hopefully there are some you know, real uh, practice changers on the phone or on this webinar that can help really uh, bring this into our community. So just wondering quickly what you think that, that lift is gonna be like. Well, so we have 50, so medicine and pharmacy are all governed by each state and territory and, and uh, Native American nation. So uh, that, that's the first problem. You know, we've been trying to get funding to do a policy analysis to deliver exactly that, uh, pardon the pun, I'm a pharmacist, the prescription for implementing this. I get one, I get one folks. All right, I'm sitting here in my office, I get one. So what's the prescription? We don't know, we need to figure out. Uh, so it may be adding initiation of therapy or maybe, making sure that pharmacists have DEA. Remember, the DEA allows mid-level practitioners to have DEA licenses as long as their state allows it. So there's only 11 states right now that allow it. Massachusetts is one of them. But for example, you can't prescribe controlled substances except in inpatient settings in Massachusetts. Hence why we talked to some, law, some lawmakers a month ago and we're trying to change the law there. So this is really a call. Um, and then the other problem is, is that there's only a handful of states that actually pay pharmacists and CPA. So why is this not continuing? People don't provide a 45 minute intake visit to connect people to care so that they come back. So remember, um, a, a large minority of folks actually didn't come back for their second visit, 42%. Uh, so if we want people to come back, we have to fix, or we have to at least begin to fix the other kinds of things and in their lives. But that takes time and that if that's unreimbursed, we're, we're not doing it there. So if we want pharmacies to be both a place-based access point and a person-based access point and a referral point, we, we, we've got the brick and mortar there, right? This isn't, let's build you know, 40 recovery centers in West Virginia, that would be great, but there's a whole bunch of pharmacies there that could be doing it. And, I, and, and even though Genoa is a chain, we need, to, um, we need to really, I encourage you all to talk to your pharmacy associations. We have a big meeting coming up. I'm gonna to talk to all of them, it's a group called NASPA, to say what, what are the CPA rules in each state? Some states prevent controlled substances. Some, state, some states um, don't allow community pharmacists, as I said. Some states don't have, don't have any DEA authority. And other states like Idaho allow pharmacists right now, pharmacists in Idaho can prescribe, can get a DEA and prescribe directly. So there's sort of two paths. There's, this, there's the direct prescribing, which still needs provider status. So they get reimbursed equally as other health providers. And there's the CPA route where the pharmacist still needs to get paid, but maybe we adapt it sort of what we've done with naloxone and statewide standing orders to say, there's a statewide authority to do BUP if you've done you know, the eight hours of training that all DEA folks are or your DEA things like that, right? No pharmacist wrote their name as the prescriber on the prescriptions because the waiver was in place, 
um, our law allowed us to to sort of delegate that authority and, and be tracked by all the usual things. So it, it's really complex and that's an hour and a half talk itself to expand. But, but despite all of that, having the waiver gone is the first step to go from there. And just to build on Gene, I was part of the, uh, we presented this actually in May at the, the SAMHSA um, pharmacy-based BUP and I, I had the paper sitting on my, my desktop here to review and send. So we're getting close to publishing more of this. Terrific, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for questions right now. So um, we'll just go to our last slide. Um, but thank you so much for an amazing presentation today. Um, and if there are any future, any other questions, definitely chat them in and we'll make sure to answer them after the fact.